Autumn 1212. Northern China lays devastated. The armies of the Jin shattered. The jewel of the East and capital of the Jin Empire, Zhongdu, one of the richest and most populous cities in the world, sits in the sights of the taut bowstring, the arrow quivering with anticipation. Following their campaign against the Jin the year before, which saw large swathes of northern China fall under their control, only the Zhuyong Pass stands between Genghis Khan and Zhongdu. Genghis sends one of his top four generals, or Hell Riders, to capture the strategic position. Jebe Noyan leads the assault and, on approaching the pass, finds it heavily fortified and garrisoned by a sizable contingent of Jin troops. After coming within sight of the Jin, a Mongol detachment approaches the fortifications and skirmishes with the Jin archers. Seemingly finding their defences too strong, the Mongol force falls back, causing apparent disarray in their rear echelons. Soon, the entire force is in a headlong retreat, leaving plunder and horses in the fields behind them. The Jin rush out from behind their protective walls and flood across the plain, tempted by the unattended spoils. However, all was not as it seemed. With much of the Jin garrison spread across the fields, the Mongols wheel around their mounts, reforming their lines with unnerving discipline. Then, the massed cavalry charge. Thousands of Mongol riders come screaming down upon the milling and disorganized Jin. The resulting conflagration is less of a battle and more of a one-sided slaughter as the Mongols sweep across the field and overwhelm the fort's remaining defenders. Having cleared the way for Genghis and the main body of the army, Jebe leads the vanguard to the outskirts of Zhongdu. The city bristles with imposing stone walls and towers, defences that any army of the age would find difficult, if not impossible, to overcome by direct assault. With their lack of knowledge in siege warfare, Genghis's army is ill-equipped to storm the city. He instead contents himself with laying waste to the countryside and by taking less well-defended towns and cities. Xi Jing, the Jin's western capital, is a tempting target. Despite being a walled city, it is smaller than Zhongdu and a good trial for the development of Mongol siege capability. During the siege, Genghis is struck with an arrow. The wound takes him out of action for several months and in his absence, he entrusts command of the armies to his son, Tolui. While Genghis heals, the Mongol army disperses to conduct raids across northern China and in one successful incident, sweep through the imperial pastures, capturing thousands of horses, thus depriving the Jin of much of their mobility. However, the Jin do not sit idly by. They launch an offensive to recapture the environs of Zhongdu and reclaim the Zhuyong Pass. Here, they construct strong fortifications manned by some of their most elite units in anticipation of further Mongol attacks. Despite the success, the loss of the Imperial pastures means that the Jin cavalry suffers a chronic lack of remounts. Further offensive is incidentally shelved until the Jin army can rebuild its mobility. Soon, Genghis's wounds heal and he once more leads his army south to Zhongdu. Upon reaching the Zhuyong Pass, Genghis contrived to avoid a costly frontal assault and instead relies on the services of Ja'far Khoja, a Muslim merchant familiar with the land and its secret paths. The merchant guides a hand-picked force through forests and across mountains, and before dawn, the Mongols break into the forts from the rear and slaughter much of the Jin garrison in their sleep. 
With the fall of Zhu Yong, the Mongols are unleashed and spread across the northern plain, plundering the rich and undefended land around Zhongdu yet again. Winter, 1214. Zhongdu sits like a ripe peach, waiting to be plucked, but just out of reach. The Mongol army surrounds the city, but the city's defenses are still too formidable for the Mongols to overcome. After many months of siege, famine and plague take root in the Mongol camp, leaving them vulnerable and steadily weakening. With this precarious situation in mind, Genghis knows that his time is running out. In an attempt to intimidate the enemy, he makes a show of strength outside the city walls and dispatches a message to the Jin court. Your districts and counties in Shandong and Hebei are now in my possession, leaving you only with Yandu. Heaven has so weakened you that if I were also now to attack you in your distress, what would heaven think of me? I therefore intend to turn back my army. Might you not provide some supplies for my troops, thus lessening the resentment of my generals? Leaping at the chance for a reprieve, the Jin offer to become a tributary state of the Mongol Empire, along with the Jin princess to marry Genghis and cement the peace. A lavish tribute of slaves and horses is given, and the army, laden with plunder, withdraws from Zhongdu. Owing to the geographic vulnerability of the city, now that all the territory to its north was under the direct control of the Mongols, the Jin made a strategic decision and moved their capital from Zhongdu further south to the city of Kaifeng. Amongst Jin allies, this move combined with their recent submission showed the Jin to be weak and cowardly. Many peoples within the remaining Jin territories end up defecting to the Mongols. Amongst the Mongols, this move is seen as defensive and hostile, and thus invokes the wrath of Genghis. With their vassalage now in question and the wind at his back, Genghis leads his army south and surrounds Zhongdu once more. Meanwhile, an influential Khitan defector, Shimo Yesen, highlights the importance of capturing the northern Jin capital, Liaoyang, which had been an early seat of Jin power. Learning that a new commandant is being sent to take control of Liaoyang, Yesen hides with a few horsemen near the main road heading to the city. As the new commandant approaches, Yesen springs an ambush, killing all in the party and appropriating the commandant's clothes and documents of royal commission. He makes his way to the city's military headquarters, where he uses the commission to proclaim his appointment as commander of the city garrison. Under Yesen's orders, the city guard is disbanded and new loyal officers are appointed to garrison the troops. Three days later, Mukali Noyan leads a force north and rides into the city without firing a single arrow. 100,000 Jin soldiers surrender as the flags of the once mighty empire are trampled under Mongol hooves. The vast city of Liaoyang has fallen. Across northern China, 32 cities throw open their gates to the invaders effectively ending all resistance in the region. Backing Zhongdu, the writing is on the wall. With news of the collapse of Jin resistance in the northeast, despair hangs heavy in the air. The city's defense is in utter chaos, as several prominent Jin commanders defect with their forces, leaving the garrisons stretched thin. A relief force is defeated in the south, and the city garrison commander commits suicide rather than see the city fall. Utilizing siege weapons built by defected Chinese engineers, 
The Mongols stormed the city walls and overwhelmed the remaining defenders. For weeks on end, the city is given over to rampant slaughter, leaving it absolutely gutted, with its once splendid palaces now turned to smouldering ruins. When a few years later, Baha ad Din, leader of a mission from Sultan Muhammad of Khwarizm, approached the capital, he saw a white hill and, in answer to his query, was told by the guide that it consisted of the bones of the massacred inhabitants. At another place, the earth was, for a long stretch of the road, greasy from human fat, and the air was so polluted that several members of the mission became ill, and some even died. This was the place, they were told, where on the day the city was stormed, 60,000 virgins threw themselves to death from the fortifications in order to escape capture by the Mongols. Despite this catastrophic defeat, the Jin refused to accept the loss of their rich northern territories, and so the war will continue on. In spring 1216, Genghis returns to Mongolia, leaving Mukali in command of northern China. In the coming years, sporadic warfare will continue, but the final showdown with the Jin will not come for over a decade. And by that time, the power of the Mongols will have grown beyond anything the younger Temujin could have ever Imagine. Thank you for watching this episode of History Thread. If you enjoyed this video, we kindly ask that you like, share, and subscribe so that we may deliver you more content more frequently. Be sure to click the bell notification icon and select all so that you can stay updated with our latest content on YouTube. Connect with us beyond YouTube as well. Follow us on social media where we plan to gradually ramp up our presence via intriguing historical tidbits, behind the scenes glimpses, and engage with you, the viewer, who makes this all possible. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Rumble. Thank you, once again, for being part of History Thread, and we hope to see you once more on another journey into the past.